Okay. Thank you, Ben. So we've had good success so far, and we can see that we have a lot left to do. So how can we scale our work? How can we move that yellow tipping point line to the left so that it happens sooner and faster? That's where you come in. Represent Us works to scale your work with training that shares successful strategies and tactics from the campaigns that have won to date. We convene the entire movement at American Democracy Summit so that we can learn from each other and be motivated by each other. We also have a dashboard of active reform campaigns on our core issues across the country. You can find this dashboard on our website under How We Win. You can check out this dashboard and see how you can be involved. We'll connect you to the, these campaigns if you live in that state. If you don't live in the state, maybe you can donate or you can volunteer with the Action Brigade and do phone banking and text banking and other actions to help the campaigns. Every little bit of help really matters. Speaking of these campaigns, I am excited to introduce Bo Harmon, who will lead a discussion with a select set of leaders from some of these active campaigns. Bo, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, and it's been, it's so cool as I'm looking through the, the chat of all of the people who are logged on. I saw Florida, I saw Virginia, Delaware, um, Kansas, California, Arizona, really all across the country, it, it's fantastic. And, and I think that that is so important because one of the things that has been so motivating to me since getting involved with Ref Us almost three years ago is that almost every week I find about I find out about a new organization that start up that has started up at the municipal level, at the state level, or sometimes even at the federal level, that's trying to do good in some way. Some of them we work with veterans and we do this with students and we do this with rural voters and we do this with independents. And all of them have a slightly different strategy and a slightly different constituency that they're working with. But all of those people are raising their hand and saying, I want to try to make things better in my country. And all of you are doing that by being here tonight. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by four of the best authorities on passing pro-voter, pro-democracy laws in your state uh, that I've come across in all of my work. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Scott Muller, Andre Bumgardner, Scott Turner, and Kellyn Potter. And I'm, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves and share a little bit about how they got involved with this work, but um, would like to, uh, so I'll just give them the opportunity to do that. Um, Scott Muller, why don't you start us off in Connecticut? Part of what we're looking at here is each of these states, Connecticut, Utah, and Georgia, are each trying to pass ranked choice voting laws through their legislature. Um, one very Democrat state, and I say very Democrat, meaning the both chambers of the legislature are Democrat and all statewide offices are Democrat, and two very Republican states, Georgia and Utah, where that same dynamic is true in the reverse. Both chambers of the legislature are Republican and all statewide offices are held by Republicans. So I'm really interested in the compare and the contrast and what sort of problems we are seeing as we try to pass these reforms in red states and in blue states and where we're finding success that we can get that done wherever we happen to be. So with that, I'd like to kick us off and we'll start with uh, our, our blue staters in Connecticut. Um, Representative Andre Baumgartner, uh, could you lead us off and introduce yourself and share a little bit about how you came to some of this work? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, Bo, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me this evening. And um, a big shout out to my counterpart, uh, Connecticut counterpart, Scott Muller, uh, who is also one of my esteemed constituents in the 41st House District. Um, I have the deep uh, honor and privilege of representing the southeastern corner of Connecticut, uh, which encompasses the southern half of Broughton, also known as the submarine capital of the world, as well as Mystic and Stonington. Um, I am currently a Democrat. I was elected to my second non-consecutive term um, in the 2022 um, election cycle, but I was also had the honor of serving in the state legislature um, getting elected back in 2014 at the age of 20, uh, which made me uh, the youngest state legislator uh, elected in, in state history. I still have that distinction today. 
um, I uh, was actually elected as a Republican, um, and that's a, certainly a story for another day, but I think um, you know, it's no doubt that um, hyper-partisanship in politics uh, has always been um, a huge uh, source of consternation for me. I, I'm someone who loves working across party lines, someone who believes that um, it's so important to have a pragmatic approach to policymaking, uh, rolling up your sleeves, solving, solving the difficult challenges confronting our communities. Um, and it is no secret that in the last uh, six to eight years, we have seen um, our state, our whole country um, become more divided. And so, um, you know, as I, I fundamentally believe that ranked choice voting uh, can serve as a tool to break that partisan divide and very much look forward to engaging in that discussion, of course. Um, and with that, I look, I'll pass it on to uh, my dear friend, Scott. You might still be muted, Scott. Yes, that will help. Um, my name is Scott Muller. I'm a retired partner in a large law firm, actually international law firm. Came to all this and been in and out of federal government uh, during my career and a and law professor as well. Um, I came to all of this really starting the day after election day 2016 because I didn't want to spend the rest of the time yelling at my TV, which I'd started to do starting in April 2016. Um, I learned about ranked choice voting during the course of work that I started doing <clears throat> right after election day with a group of others. Um, some work in ranked choice voting had already been done in Connecticut by the time I got involved in the fact, I think one of the, the people on whose shoulders we stand, Jonathan Perlow is on this call. Um, there was a group that started all this in 2019, independent of, of our efforts. Um, I formed uh, Connecticut Voters First in 2018 um, with a former gubernatorial candidate by the name of Oz Griebel. Um, and I've been working really since then um, and very actively since we got the support of the governor for ranked choice voting uh, in the fall of uh, 2023 um, as 2020, yeah, 2022, excuse me, as he was heading into his election cycle. Um, so I can describe later what we're doing here, Bo, but it seems to me as background, that, that's probably what you need. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. And Connecticut Voters First um, that Scott helps lead is one of the premier uh, grassroots advocacy organizations in the country. Another is Utah Ranked Choice Voting, which is led by our good friend, Kelly Potter. And so, Kelly, could you share a little bit about yourself and the work you're doing there? Thanks so much, Bo. It's so fun to be here with all of you. And I'm so excited for the work that we're doing here and the opportunity to collaborate with so many more people. So I was a high school government teacher and I got recruited to be the state director of elections in Utah many years ago. And I got to take a deep dive into the world of elections and found it to be fascinating. I took a lot of years off to be a stay-at-home mom and then ran for office in my city and became the mayor. And while I was mayor, I went to a League of Cities and Towns conference and learned about ranked choice voting. And after that, they asked me to help with ranked choice voting because Utah just had this new pilot program. And we had a couple cities that were going to try this new way of voting. And it was so exciting, but we wanted to make sure everyone was educated and the election officials knew what they were doing. And we started with two and then we went to 23 and 12. And so that's why, how I got involved. And I'm really seeing it make a difference in Utah. That's great. And the work you, you're doing there in Utah is really just tremendous. Um, and our, our, our final panelist is one of a good friend of mine, Scott Turner. He, um, is the founder and president of Eternal Vigilance, a non a nonpartisan nonprofit organization in Georgia that is leading the ranked choice voting effort there. So Scott, if you could share a little bit about yourself and, and the work you're doing. Sure, thanks Bo, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. I was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives in 2013 in a special election that required a runoff. Here in Georgia, we use runoff elections extensively. We're the only state that uses them in both the primary, well, there are other states that do it, or have it on the books now, but we're the only ones that have used it in both our primary and general elections. And in a special election, uh, it was during a Christmas time election. It's a great time to run for office, by the way. Highly recommend it Don't. where you have a political mail coming at the same time as your Christmas cards. Uh, and the turnout was just absolutely miserable. So the the we had a five way race. The total my vote total in the first round equaled the vote total in the second round. 
And that was uh, an indicator to me that that's a broken system that needs to be fixed. And now I've uh, been searching for the answer to that and found it in ranked choice voting. And that's why I'm here today and trying, there's some, some specific problems we're trying to fix here in Georgia that ranked choice voting really does provide the best possible solution. Thank you. Um, and Scott, while a lot of our listeners are familiar with ranked choice voting, could you outline, like using the, the runoffs in Georgia as an example of how ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, as it's sometimes called, just kind of how that works? Sure. For people who might not be totally familiar. Yeah, sure. Um, our runoff system requires that somebody gets 50 percent plus one of the total votes cast in and if nobody does, the top two candidates move on to a runoff. So we see this oftentimes now in our statewide races where or in a in a contested primary for a, a local or a state legislative race where uh, uh, there we have the spoiler effect, if you will. And there are three major problems our current runoff system creates. The first is that uh, the local governments are required to pay for those additional elections. Uh, in the form of those runoffs. And it costs about $75 million in aggregate. Those are dollars that are in competition with our our police budgets, our fire budgets, our filling pothole budgets, right? Those are the local dollars come out. And so our local government is, is really taxed to the brink here with this huge cost. Now, some people would say cost is, doesn't matter if you're delivering a majoritarian winner. But the second problem, our runoff uh, system creates is a massive drop off in turnout. We've seen 500,000 to 700,000 people not return for the second round. So we're, we really get a, a a plurality result delayed at, by a full month, and it's costing us $75 million to do so. That's a huge problem. So uh, bad for democracy all around. And the third problem is that the runoff creates a scenario where we have to have these additional months of campaigning. It goes into the holidays. So when America and Georgia are trying to come together around things like the SEC championship football game, we're bombarded with ads in every break about how horrible Raphael Warnock is or how terrible uh, Herschel Walker is. And that's another type of problem that we would be solving if we could move to an instant runoff system. And it's important to know that, that ranked choice voting or instant runoffs is not a massive tweak to what we do in Georgia um, or a massive overhaul. It is it is just a tweak um, as opposed to a massive overhaul because we're, we're taking that runoff process, the thought process of if my first candidate doesn't get 50% plus one that and they're out, who's my second choice? That's already something that is familiar to Georgians. So replacing runoffs with an instant runoff makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Thank you. That, that's super helpful. Um, Killing help. Um, the other folks on the call understand kind of the political dynamics that you're working with in Utah and you know, what the path to victory is. What is it? I mean, because Scott is trying to save money by ending runoffs and having majority winners still. What's what's kind of the focus in Utah and what's the what's the path to victory? Um, sure, you bet. As you mentioned earlier, we have a we have a super majority Republican legislature and all statewide offices are Republican. And when we when the Utah legislature approved this pilot program, the legislature said, hey, yeah, let's try this out. Let's do it for four municipal election cycles and cities can opt in. And it was- so this was for municipalities to yeah, try it if they wanted cities. to. Yeah, just cities could try it and they had to opt into it. And our biggest year, we had 23 cities opt in. And after that, the political dynamics changed to where the far right, um, some of the election denier people decided they didn't like ranked choice voting. So what's happening now is we have a bill in our legislature to end the pilot program. We should have one more cycle. And of course, we want to extend it as a permanent option for cities. But we have legislators who are trying to stop it at this uh, at, during the session, which is happening right now. And the challenge that we're finding is that there are legislators who say that people will come to them and say, don't vote for this. Ranked choice voting is terrible. And they'll say, why? Well, I don't know. Ask so-and-so. So it seems it's just a classic example of this polarization where people have learned that, that their team doesn't like ranked choice voting. 
they don't really understand it. They don't really know why, but they have been told to go out and lobby against it. And in the past, it was sort of like people weighing out the pros and the cons. And now we have a whole different political dynamic where we're trying to stop um, it from being eliminated. And our goal is to do a much better job at the grassroots organizing and get people to tell their legislators why they like it and why they want to keep it going in Utah. Thank you. That's really helpful. Scott, uh, in Georgia, um, are you seeing some of that same pushback from within the Republican Party? Oh, 100 uh, percent. We're fighting off a ban bill similar to what Colleen has has seen there. Uh, we, we feel like we have a pretty good handle on that, but anything could change at the moment. Uh, at any moment, the the political realities from the fallout of the Alaska result has really changed uh, the dynamic here in Georgia. We took U the Utah pilot program and modeled it here. We got uh, two years ago, we had a bill that passed out of committee unanimously. Both Republicans and Democrats uh, led the, the bill was sponsored on a bipartisan basis, and both both parties seemed OK with that Utah model. And uh, it did not pass out of the legislature that year because we have been the center of the political universe when it comes to election reforms and SB 202 and other things. There was just no real appetite to start tweaking elections the year that we were able to get that passed. Then Alaska happened and instantaneously the mood changed. Uh, it went from being very receptive if, uh, to both parties to being a really a partisan issue. We, we still have – Republican champions here, but they're under extreme pressure from the right to dump the idea altogether. And so we're having to to do some triage and also support them. We have a couple of really good Republicans who have sponsored a piece of legislation called HB 200 uh, that uh, they've just been absolutely slandered and defamed and they really need our help. And so uh, we're, we're working to try to not only fight back the narrative that we should ban ranked choice voting, but also support the people who see the value in it, regardless of the political pressure that they're feeling. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting. Without that pressure from the right and being in a solidly Democratic state, Scott Mueller and, and Representative Baumgartner, I'm sure that ranked choice voting must be just sailing through with no, no problems at all. Um, help us understand the dynamics that you're seeing in Connecticut around the bill and what kind of the political landscape looks like there. Sure, let, 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 Andre, why don't I start with that and maybe turn this over to you. So um, for, it's probably worth starting with, with what, our, what our proposal is, which is actually narrow and intentionally narrow. We are proposing essentially enabling legislation because our statutes are written in such a way that without the enabling legislation, there's already a ban, not because it was intended, but because our statutes require plurality. So we're seeking enabling legislation for primaries, and in particular for the presidential primary, um, and as options for the parties to use ranked choice voting if they wish, with one exception, and that is a mandatory ranked choice voting ballot for presidential preference primaries. We have a bipartisan bill um, uh, that's been introduced to do that, um, the support of the governor, lieutenant governor, and others. Um, why do we choose that, what I'll call narrow enabling path? Um, in part because um, and we now actually have a brand new opinion from our attorney general saying that ranked choice voting for the gen for the general assembly and the state offices is unconstitutional. It's unfortunate that that opinion came out, but it just did. Um, we anticipated that as an issue and tried to navigate around it. Um, the Democratic Party is is you know done well in this state, um, and we didn't want to present a bill that we thought would be threatening to them um, and their and their sort of power here. And we sell and I think have had some success in selling ranked choice voting in primaries as being helpful to parties to get better candidates in the general election and to do better. Um, so, Andre, maybe I'll turn this over to you, but that's sort of the, the path we're, we're, we're proposing and why. Very interesting. How, how is it looking from the inside uh, of the legislature, Representative? Absolutely. Well, as Scott mentioned, um, this proposal has to pass the legislature. Um, you know, our legislature is heavily Democratic. Um, in the House, we have uh, 98 Democrats, 53 Republicans, so nearly two-thirds majority. And then in the uh, state Senate, 24 Democrats and 12 Republicans, and so a two-thirds majority. So, um, you know, with all, a near veto-proof majority um, in both chambers. And uh, also a Democratic governor uh, that has voiced his support for ranked choice voting. 
um, in the past election cycle. I would note, I think um, uh, Mr. Mueller played a huge role in uh, getting the governor um, to uh, sign on this proposal in large part because of the party that previously endorsed um, Oz Grebel, who was uh, one of uh, the governor's opponents four years earlier, um, campaigned heavily on this um, proposal. And um, the very interesting thing about um, elections here in Connecticut is that uh, even though we have pretty much a two-party duopoly, you know, Republicans and de Democrats, um, there still is an are, there still are opportunities for minor parties to get on the ballot. And so um, Oz Grebel did have a, um, a ballot position that um, ultimately uh, endorsed, uh, the, the party endorsed the governor's um, re-election campaign in large part because of his endorsement of ranked choice voting. So um, I'm a good friend of the governor's. Uh, you know, I support a um, uh, good chunk of his proposals, um, but um, you know, uh, rest assured I will be holding his feet to the fire to ensure that um, we can get this over the finish line, especially since that this proposal is a lot more narrow in scope, uh, more focused on presidential primaries and municipal elections. Uh, actually, in our um, in our uh, the communities um, that I represent, and Scott lives in Stonington, um, we actually just saw the election of a, or the um, uh, the first selectman of Stonington was just reelected on the forward party line. She previously ran as a Democrat. Um, two election cycles and actually ran on the forward party line in large part to break that partisan divide. And despite the fact that it was a four-way race, she still won the majority of the votes. But a lot of folks were very concerned about the outcome of the election. You know, what would happen if uh, the individual for first electman did not get 50% of the vote? Um, and I think, again, this is where ranked choice voting could um, very much matter. Um, so I, again, think this more narrowed um, proposal, I think, can, um, has a lot more. Um, it, it has, we have a great opportunity to get this over the finish line again with a more narrowed uh, bill. I, sh I should just add that that recently re-elected first electman is a huge fan of ranked choice voting. And if we get the authority to get municipal elections using ranked choice voting, Stonington will be high on the list of the first candidates to do that. Right. What... I mean, we heard, you know, um, Kellyanne and Scott Turner talk about some of the challenges of the shift in the Republican Party, or at least the, some wing of the Republican Party and its orientation towards ranked choice voting. And I'd like to ask you, are there other challenges, Scott and Kellyanne, are there other challenges that you face kind of besides the party shift? What else are you seeing? And I guess what I'm kind of trying to tease out is what sort of similar con or similar barriers exist in red states and in blue states? What are we running into in Georgia and in Utah and in Connecticut, regardless of the politics of the state? Um, I can take a shot at that, or Kelly, and go ahead, whichever you prefer. Um, I'll, I'll, let me just do this very quickly. What, putting aside the party politics, and candidly, I think our our proposal will help us get past the party politics to a certain extent. Um, there, look, there is in this state, it's new. Not that many people understand it. And the general reaction to things that people don't understand is I'm not sure I want to do it. We have a hurdle to, 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 to get over with respect to that. In this state, we're surprisingly pretty backwards in terms of electoral law. And that we've just moved to early voting. We're about to get no excuse absentee voting. There's a certain amount of fatigue. Candidly, the Democrats have done, you know, been in control for a while. Um, there are many who perceive that things are going well, and I must say, I think they are going reasonably well. Um, but uh, there's a little bit of a sense of is, our, is ranked choice voting a solution in search of a problem? Um, and I think in, in primaries, and given how, how our primary and, and candidate selection system works, this will help a lot, but that's a, at least a part of the problem. So newness, reform fatigue in this state, um, the recent attorney general opinion didn't help, obviously. Um, but those are the, what I would perceive as the, as the major issues. And they're not partisan. They're just the reality of bringing something new. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Kellyanne or Scott, do you see those similar sorts of problems? Yeah, I would agree with the newness. I, I, I was kind of blaming it on being conservatives and that people don't want to try something new. But sorry, my camera's freezing. But I think that is one of the things. I also think in our country right now, people are really easily led to believe that something is bad or someone's trying to trick them or there's some conspiracy. 
And we had an election in one of our largest cities. And I read through a survey they did. And some of the responses were, I, it was a, a nonpartisan municipal election. And people would say, I don't like ranked choice voting. We should be able to know their pl par political party. It was almost like they were saying, I don't like ranked choice voting. It rained that day. Like there were things that had nothing to do with ranked choice voting. But because the people who are against ranked choice voting were able to kind of get the message out that it was bad, people just hopped on the bandwagon without even understanding it. And I've had, I've talked to even a legislator recently, very conservative legislator, and talking about the polling that we've done and showing that the majority of Utahns really like ranked choice voting, particularly those who have tried it. I don't trust that polling. Like they just dismiss the facts and the data because they think they know because their friend told them. So I think that's a really hard hurdle in our lack of trust culture right now with our political system. And I think that I'm sure that's happening everywhere. It's bipartisan. It's yeah. absolutely right. It's a real issue. Um, Bo, I am currently fielding the Q&A section, and I just wonder if I could highlight a few of the questions that I will then turn it over to you to weave into your next um, engagement, if that's okay. Of course. Thank you. Um, so Sue Fothergill here, Director of Organizing, and we see um, a question about whether there are studies or other um, information, other information available to us that helps us know if ranked choice voting is helping address issues like polarization or increasing engagement from uh, voters or reducing feelings of disenfranchisement. And just to uh, tease in a few more of these um, questions, are there any concerns with ranked choice voting? Um, and and I want to, um, and how would you describe opponents to RCV? Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to over to you all, but thank you for considering the questions in the Q&A. Okay, that, that is really interesting. Um, Scott Muller and, and Representative Baumgartner, what sort of um, objections are you hearing kind of on the policy side? Andre? Um, what I failed to mention is that in, in Connecticut, before anything hits the House floor or the Senate floor for a vote, it has to make its way through um, a, one of the legislative committees. So in this case, um, any election reform bill has to go through the government administration and elections, uh, which is actually a bicameral committee. So um, it is co-chaired by a House and Senate member, um, and there are two ranking members from each, um, each chamber as well. And um, in most cases, a good chunk of, of bills do um, pass on a bipartisan basis, which is, which is great. Um, however, uh, when it comes to election reform measures, as you, as you can imagine, like many other states uh, at this time, um, very few bills uh, do pass on a bipartisan basis. What's unique about our uh, proposal is that it does have bipartisan consensus and support. Um, and so it is, uh, that, that is important to note. However, um, still need to work some of our GAE co-chairs on the issue. Um, and so that is a, a conversation that all of us will be engaging in in the next few weeks. Uh, today, actually, we commenced the beginning of our uh, legislative session, our first day of uh, uh, the short legislative session, of course. Uh, so it's been a very long day. Um, but nonetheless, um, it is so important that we uh, continue to articulate uh, reasons for um, you know, uh, passing a more narrow um, bill for with with respect to ranked choice voting in, in the weeks to come. Well, let me use that as an opportunity to ask how represent us as an organization, as a as a outreach mechanism, all of the people on this call. How what would be some tangible ways that they can support the effort in Connecticut or Georgia or Utah specifically? Um, what would what is most helpful? Say somebody's in state. And there's somebody else from out of state. So for in-state people, what would be the most helpful ways that they could get involved uh, to help make sure that this passes? Absolutely. I'll, I'll answer this briefly and then pass it on to Scott. You know, we, we heard some of the, uh, the, the poll earlier, um, you know, asking questions, you know, what, what is your biggest priority, whether it's anti-corruption, anti-gerrymandering, you know, building a national movement, um, RCV, et cetera. Um, but really, you know, I think it's so important to bring people together. Um, and how do we do that, you know, but with the pursuit of, a, you know, a more just and, and equitable democracy uh, that promotes fairness, um, transparency, you know, in government and, and representation and core values that for all of us. And so I, I think it's really, really important that um, you engage your legislators, 
you engage your senators. I hope um, I'm, I'm looking on the call. We have hundreds of people um, on the Zoom right now. I hope each and every one of you can name your who your state senator is and who your state representative is. And then within the next 48 hours, you write your representative or your senator about the power and importance of ranked choice voting and how that reform measure can um, you know, pay dividends for protecting our democracy in the long run. Uh, I would note, as I mentioned earlier, Scott is one of my constituents. Um, RCV, quite frankly, probably would not have been on my radar screen had it not been for the robust conversations I've had with Scott over uh, the last couple of years on this um, um, policy proposal. So I cannot overstate the importance of engaging your legislators, uh, especially when they are in the legislative session, um, and actually being well versed on the proposals that are before um, the, those legislators being specific. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to Scott. Well, let me, I, I think I can do this relatively succinctly. Let me try. So um, in Connecticut, get to our website, um, sign up. We have a whole mechanism for getting to legislators one by one. We are targeting specific legislators. So in particular locations, sort of getting people to both write to their legislators and candidly pass the word is critically important, number one. Number two, it's actually interesting. You have on this call a number of people who are obviously interested enough in this general subject of how do I improve my democracy to be on here, but who themselves don't really understand the ins and outs of ranked choice voting. Not a surprise. Most people are like that. So general education um, of what it is and the simple arguments that we know all those of us who spend a lot of time doing it know how to rehearse, um, we need to get them out there and in, in very, at least in this case, in this state, in sort of a targeted way. And the last and probably the most important, the disinformation, as Colleen put it, of the opposition, it's very easy to deal with if we just have someone who will listen to it. So in this state, you know, rehearsing the two or three arguments that are made against it, which are easily rebutted with actual facts, is something we could use some help with. Getting people to listen to facts these days is hard. Um, but that's all we can do. Engage your legislature and educate yourself and educate your your community about it. I love it. Yep. Scott um, Turner, what about in Georgia? If people want to help support the cause, what what would be the way to do that? Yeah, so we we are leading a coalition of groups that are interested in this issue. And I'd point you first to Better Ballot Georgia, which is the grassroots advocacy group that we we are are loosely affiliated with we don't have a formal arrangement but we do cheer them on in their grassroots activism if you're here you can learn more about them at better ballot uh, georgia or ga.org and then of course we're at eternalvigilance.us and uh, obviously we echo the same things as representative bumgartner and and uh, Mr. Mueller just said about getting in contact with your legislators, and we'd be happy to assist with that. Either group, if you go and sign up with either of us, we'll be able to help. Kelly, I would one thing that um, I know that you have talked about is trying to get people to engage not just with their legislature, but also with the with in, in Utah with the state party. And with their local with their local party, if they're Republican and in a state that is so heavily Republican, you know, a super majority legislature, as you said, that that was a really interesting um, a, approach that I would not have thought of necessarily. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, it is ironic that it was the Republican Party that brought ranked choice voting to Utah. And as a delegate, I know all the delegates loved it. We cut our conventions down from 10 hours to three hours and everyone was loving it. Then all of a sudden the narrative changed. And so that's why it's important because if the parties keep using it and people are familiar with it and they're not afraid of it, then we can continue this program. And I feel like the people who are against it, they're using fear. Oh, it's a democratic takeover. And we're, you know, look what happened in Alaska and self-interest where they know if they're even on the far wing of the Republican party and they represent a small mi minority that will not get people elected, those are their motivating factors. And they're very, um, they're very organized and they're very loud. And people that like ranked choice voting tend to use data and reason and explanations, and it's just harder to get through to legislators. So briefly, House Bill 290, for those of you who are in Utah, it's in the Government Operations Committee. Um, feel free to reach out to any of those legislators or feel free to get onto our website, utahrcv.com, get onto our newsletter. There will be times when we're probably going to do some phone banking, but right now we're waiting for this bill to get on an agenda. 
hopefully hoping that it doesn't. We had a circus last year and we don't want to repeat it, but it looks like it might show up again. So that's what we're doing in Utah. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank well, you. Um, as we I round would, out- I would love to continue this for another hour, but I know that we need to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I know Scott and Representative Baumgartner have had a long day with their first day in the legislature. So thank you both so much for taking um, time on such a busy day to spend with us. Scott Turner is also in the, and Kellyanne both, I know we're in the middle of legislative sessions in their states fighting these battles. And so very grateful to each of you for taking your time to, to walk us through the politics and what's similar and what's different between trying to pass RCV in the legislature in a red state versus a blue state and um, what we can do to get people involved in their own state. So thank you all very much. And I'll turn it back over to John Devan to close this out. Thank you, Bo. And John, as you come on, um, do you mind addressing one last question in the Q&A before you uh, close us out? And sure, I think you would be, um, thank you. And so the question is, how can we as taxpayers hold our elected officials accountable even when we struggle to make appointments with them or get to see them in person? Um, yeah, in interesting question. Of course, the main way is to be active and um, participate. If you don't like what they're doing, voting them out. <laughs> um, then um, there are um, oftentimes, this is my point about building the movement, you know, we we try to organize a lot of groups. The the panelists were just talking about the and you saw the importance of their local groups that know the layout of the local area and know what the important touch points are and the timing is and all that kind of stuff. Things that the national group can't do, we can support them by bringing people to participate. So I would say join one of these local groups. Um, you can you can also if you if you sign up with represent us I'll get that to a minute uh, in a minute you'll you'll be able to be connected to campaigns across the country really easily, um, so you know that's the the most important thing in democracy is to be active and join with others that think like you um, in a group that can apply more resources and have a louder voice collectively. I hope that answered your question. Um, thank you very much, everybody. That was a, I think that was a fantastic, fantastic panel. Um, thank you, Scott, Andre, Scott, and Colleen, and Bo. Um, it's really motivating to me to hear from these local leaders. It's really important that all of you were here to, to listen to them and hear them. And I hope that you were as motivated after hearing them speak as I was. Um, so now we get to the part about, well, what can you do um, to help? And the first, the first thing in, a few, in our list of a few different ways is to join the Action Brigade. This is our team of volunteers that give air cover and support to city and state campaigns across the country. Sign up and you can make phone calls, you can text banks, send letters to the editor. Um, you know, sometimes you text bank to get people to call their legislature to refer back um, to the panel. Um, whatever the campaigns need, we endeavor to bring volunteers from across the country to help support these campaigns. Um, when you sign up, if you're in a state with an active campaign, we can connect you directly to that campaign. If you're not in the state, you can do all these other activities. Um, ben, who you met earlier, um, runs this program and he makes it really fun and easy to participate. So please sign up to be active in fighting for democracy. Um, the second way, maybe volunteering isn't right for you, um, you can help by donating. Um, joining the Commonwealth, which is a community of folks who give whatever money they can um, every month, and we like to say for less than the cost of Netflix, you can be saving democracy and be a part of every one of these victories across the country. Um, what's important about these donations is that they go 100% to the frontline campaigns. It does not go to represent us staffers or overhead, but 100% in supporting the people on the front lines. So please consider joining the Commonwealth. We would absolutely love to have your support. Lastly, 
um, you can get activated yourself and start organizing locally. You can use the Represent Us resource library to get started. Um, you'll find all the information you need to be effective. Stay in contact with us. And as you get organized and build momentum, we'll be able to help you along the way. Um, and of course, you don't have to pick just one. Um, you can actually do all three, um, which is a lot of fun. You get to meet people that are like-minded and make an impact and really make a difference. So thank you all very much for attending today. I hope you found it as valuable as I did and as energizing as I did. Um, the opportunity to hear from these amazing people who are leading the front lines in these local campaigns um, is, is a fantastic thing, and uh, I love it. I love hearing what's going on. Thinking back to the strategy that I outlined earlier, we know how to win back our democracy. Please get involved today and help us build the movement that will save American democracy. Thank you all very much and have a great evening.